Somebody make some noise for Jesus. <laughs> Look at whichever neighbor you like the best and tell them money talks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, whoo, hope you ain't got spiritual whiplash. Take you out a moment like that to a video like that. And what, what in the world would make a pastor put on an Afro wig and do all that just for series? To be extra? Eh, yeah, of course. But not only that, believe it or not, I actually, once upon a time, had a desire not to be a preacher, but to be an actor. Oh, yes, I, I wanted to be an actor when I was growing up. I figured I looked like Denzel. May as well, shut up. May as well. <laughs> May as well act like him. And so any moment I get in Social Dallas, we're going to do a music video. I'm going to put on a wig and I'm going to do some type of little video like that. But I also chose to do that video, perhaps, to bring some laughter and levity to a subject that everybody has to deal with, that everybody is affected by. Something that everybody has a philosophy on how it should be used and yet nobody teaches you about it in school. And then nobody likes to talk about it in church. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about money. Over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about money, 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 money. Mon yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> we're going to talk about money. And I, I'm fully aware of the elephant that's in the room. It is a sensitive subject to talk about in church. People don't mind you talking about money, but in church? Ooh. It can be a sensitive subject. Matter of fact, in full transparency, I've been, I've been pastoring this church now for uh, two years. And I've <laughs> been pastoring this church for two years, but I have been in church my entire life. Been preaching since I was 16 years old. And there's one thing I have noticed as a church kid and a proud Sunday school alumnus. When you start talking about money in church, ooh, folks start acting funny. Oh, if you want to see people start looking like they sucking on lemons and they constipated, just start talking about money in church. It is a sensitive subject. As a matter of fact, ooh, I've seen preachers talk about money and talk about the principle of tithe. And if you looked at the faces of the people in the room, you would think that the preacher was selling a timeshare or something. Because in church, people tend to act funny when you talk about money. Matter of fact, you don't believe me, let's do a survey right now. I guarantee you, raise your hand if you know somebody that will never set foot into a church because they believe that the church is a holy hustle and they think all the church wants is their money. Can I see your hand if you know somebody like that? Look at all these hands. Come on, come on. Okay, keep your hand lifted if you are that person. <laughs> and it's your first time at social. Welcome to our money series. <laughs> it, it, it's a sensitive subject and I will say rightfully so. Oh, I will dare not come against any emotions or any feelings that you have, because let's be honest, the church has not done the greatest job when it comes to the subject of money. Make no doubt about it. There are a myriad of churches and ministries and televangelists and preachers that have done an egregious disservice to the testimony of Jesus and the way that they've talked about and handled money. I mean, we could go down the list. Preachers begging for money as if God is broke and is late on his payments. Preachers taking scriptures out of context to take up an offering. Preachers postulating a prosperity gospel under the false pretense that if you sow a certain amount of money or buy some miracle water, God's going to make you a millionaire by midnight. Or preachers who just simply lack financial integrity and have zero accountability to the point that the church funds their lavish lifestyle. Oh, believe me when I tell you, I am fully aware that it's difficult for a preacher to talk about money. Whenever I see those preachers who do that and have given the church and Jesus a bad name, I almost want to point at them like you point at them people at your family reunion and say, oh, I don't know them. I'm not related to them. It's, it's, I'm fully aware. This is the reason why sometimes when I'm on a plane, whew, I don't tell people I'm a preacher. I tell them I'm in the oil industry. <laughs> Anointing. Oh, I just <laughs> don't want to start the conversation. <laughs> because of the bad reputation that the church has gotten around money. Matter of fact, I said this first service, he was in the first service, we have a member here uh, that has this beautiful Rolls Royce, beautiful Rolls Royce SUV, and I'll never forget, we had just been one year here in Gillies, and he was pulling out, as all y'all were pulling out, and he had had this beautiful little Rolls Royce SUV, and he was calling me over to the car to come say, what's up? And I, he's a good friend, he was calling me over to the car to say, what's up? But I saw all y'all coming out of church, and I saw his Rolls Royce, and I froze in my tracks, I gave him a good little Forrest Gump wave from a distance. 
that, because I know y'all, because if you would have seen me by that Rolls Royce, I'd be like, mm-hmm. Pastor Social Dallas, struggling church plant. He got a Rolls Royce SUV. Oh, I stay right by my little Ram truck. And then that's a beautiful car from a distance. It's difficult to talk about money in church. And if it was up to me, social fam, I promise you, if it was up to me, I would never preach about it. I would never talk about it. I wouldn't do any illustrations about it. Eh. Only problem is, I'm just one of those preachers that believes that whatever Jesus talked about, I should talk about. And whatever Jesus preached about, I have a mandate and a responsibility to preach about. And ladies and gentlemen, Jesus talked about money. He talked about money a lot. Like, if I preached about money as much as Jesus talked about money, y'all would cancel me and would not come back to Social Dallas. Jesus talked about money a lot. There are over 2,000 scriptures in your Bible on money. Jesus talked about money more than he talked about faith, more than he talked about prayer, more than he talked about heaven. Every time your Savior got in front of an audience, the master storyteller would tell these parables that would captivate his audience. And within those parables, 40% of them were all about money. And a certain man had three servants and five talents he gave to one and two talents to another and one talent to another. Jesus was constantly talking about money. Now, here's what I did notice in Scripture, and it's going to make some of y'all who don't like church shout. Jesus never asked for money. So I'm like, hallelujah, well, stop the offering. <laughs> he never asked. He never did. The only time I see biblically where Jesus asked for money is when he asked for a coin for illustration. And as far as I know, he gave it right back. Jesus <laughs> never asked for money. Now, don't shout too much. He did receive money. Oh, the Bible is clear that there were some sisters that were holding it down and were supporting the ministry of Jesus and said, if he's going to go out here and preach this gospel, he got to eat. And if he don't go out here and preach this gospel and all these 12 dudes have left their jobs to follow him, somebody got to support the ministry. Oh, he didn't ask for it, but he did receive it. Ooh, see, y'all don't like that right there. See, the church is the only environment where people can come in and get a good message, good worship, and be here and criticize and critique even, but never feel like they should ever make a deposit into it. Stop paying your Netflix account just once. Stop paying your gym membership because you know this was your year to get snatched and get it together. Stop. Stop paying and see what happens. But it's funny. It's funny that people in the church sometimes criticize something that they never have made an investment in. And Jesus never asked for money. But the Bible is clear that people supported his ministry. And I want to be clear. This series is in no way, shape, or form a setup. And oh, here we go. He's trying to get money. No, no, no. We already took up the offering. We're doing good. <laughs> Our books are great. But what I do want you to look at is why would Jesus consistently talk about something that he never overtly asked for? Maybe it's because of what he was after. You understand that Jesus is after something. He is after people. And he is after your heart. Oh, he is obsessed with your heart. Have you noticed this about our Savior? He has this obsessive, compulsive disorder, if you will, about having all of you. Not just some of you, but your whole heart. So maybe he talked about money because he knew that nothing has the power to connect, capture, and even contaminate your heart like money. He knew that if you truly want to know a person's heart, don't listen to their lips. Lips lie. Numbers don't. Follow the money. All I got to do to see what you love is just look at your bank account because our bank statements are theological documents that reveal what we truly love and who our true God really is. I love what that great preacher and evangelist Billy Graham said. He said, tell me what you think about money and I will tell you what you think about God. For these two are closely related a man's heart is closer to his wallet than anything else. Another writer said, if you really want to know what a culture believes, look at two things. Number one, how they date. Love is blind. And how they spend their money. If you don't agree with the words of Billy Graham or that writer, then let's look at the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus does something interesting. He goes to a mountain it's what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And he sits down, he begins like a three-chapter sermon series. He just starts going on different topics, too. It's almost kind of like schizophrenic Jesus. He's just jumping from subject to subject. But I love the first words out of Jesus' mouth in this powerful, potent sermon. First words out of his mouth in the sermon 
are blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are the poor he starts off the sermon by first of all letting you know that if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven you have to come in broke yeah. some of y'all are like well hallelujah sign me up I don't know what you're talking about money for anyway I'm, I'm ready for the kingdom no <laughs> not, not broke in your actual finances I'm talking about broke in your spirit blessed are the poor in spirit in other words you can't come to Jesus with swag you can't come to Jesus talking about, oh, I, well, I know what I offer you. Well, I've been a good person. Please, your righteousness is ratchet. It is as filthy rags. This is the entry point into the kingdom of God. You have to come in broke. It is not your record. It is not your resume. It's not your one-year Bible reading plan. I don't care how much you lifted up your hands in worship and did the Holy Ghost two-step. It has nothing to do with your performance, but everything to do with his performance. You can contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary for him to die on a cross is not your record. So get your little resume and your straight A's to the side. You got to come into the kingdom broke. So he starts off saying blessed are the poor in spirit. He talks about this power of humility. And then he goes from humility and he starts talking about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy he starts coming right at the Pharisees. I can see Jesus mugging them while he's preaching about them. Saying y'all are like whitewashed tombs that externally you put on a good show, know how to pray, powerful prayers, but you have no inner substance. And I can see him as he's preaching about hypocrisy, all the millennials in the crowd are like, yeah, get them, can't hate, can't stand hypocrites. He's like, oh wait, I'm coming follow y'all. Because <laughs> after the humility, after the hypocrisy, then he touches on something that affects all of us. Hmm. Hedonism and materialism. And he says, let's start talking about your treasure. But that's the context of this verse. Let's look at it in Matthew chapter 6. Y'all bored yet? Look at it in Matthew chapter 6. Look what Jesus says. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Ooh. That whole verse is delicious, but it's verse 24 that I want you to hone in on because it jacked me up. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and, okay, y'all fall asleep. Can you bring me a water while I wake them up real quick? Uh, this side of the room, y'all going to be God. This side of the room, y'all going to be money, okay? I need you to say it like you had some enthusiasm, okay? Come on, you got your shout out earlier. I need you to lay in. Here we go. Uh, you can't serve both God and Come on, say it with your chest. You cannot serve both God and money. God, money. God, money. God, money. Isn't that an odd comparison? That God would say, you can't serve God and money. He didn't say God and your spouse. He didn't say God in your job. He didn't say God in your kids. He's like, your kids are not in competition with me. <laughs> he said, you can't serve. God and money. this is an interesting comparison, not just because it's emanating from the mouth of the master. It is an interesting comparison because you know the greatness of something by what you compare it to. <sighs> who, who the greatest player? Michael Jordan or... Say with me. Who, who the greatest rapper? Tupac or? Okay. Who, who was the better singer? Mariah Carey or? Okay. A lot of mixed answers. But majority I heard, stay with me, Michael and LeBron. Tupac and Biggie, Mariah and Whitney. 
Oh, somebody took that person. <laughs> Here, here's what I'm confused about. How come you would say Mike and Larry Bird? No shade to Larry. How, how come you would say, how come you would say uh, Tupac and then how come nobody said Vanilla Ice? How come when I said Mariah, I heard more Whitney's, I didn't hear one J-Lo? No shade to J-Lo, but I would say more dancer than singer. <laughs> there is a context of comparison. And your God says that the only thing vying for ultimate authority in your life on the same level of me is money. That's how powerful it is. He knew that his number one competitor for the ultimate authority in your life is not your job. It's not your kids. It's money. Can we go deep sea diving? What does God do? Somebody said everything. Somebody said be God. What, what does he do? What does he do? He provides. What else? He heals. He loves. Come on, we'd be here all day. He's a way maker. Come on. Miracle worker. Promise keep a lot. Do the whole song. Okay, that's what he does. But let's go back to Genesis. What did he do from the beginning? Cre How did he create? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness covered the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. And God said, he talks. Your God is a communicator. This is the beauty of our God. All other gods are dead. Our God was dead and he rose from the grave so we could actually have connection and relationship with him and he knows how to communicate. He knows how to talk. Matter of fact, I love God because he can speak in surround sound. The heavens are telling the glory of God. You can go out on the ocean and see the waves as they crash against the shore or just stand at a peaceful sea and God will be speaking to you. He'll speak through your kids. He'll speak through a movie. He knows how to talk to you. God talks. And his competitor is who? Money. So money. Money talks. Huh? Excuse me? Huh? 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 Oh, huh? 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 <laughs> I told you I want to be an actor. Huh? <laughs> huh? What, what'd you say? Tip? Okay, huh? Oh. Yeah, money will talk to you. You know what money will tell you? Trust me like you trusted God. Believe in me like you believe in him. Let me open doors for you the way he opens doors for you. Let me give you power the way he gives you power. Please, you think, that, you think that's power? No, let me give you power. Let me give you a position. Let me guide you. Let me be the thing that you make your decisions on. Let me be the one that you refer to first before you do it. M excuse me, money? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, money talks. Money will say things to you like, let me be your security. I want to talk to all the saviors, for all the sa saviors, all the savers. You know those people, don't they get on your nerves? They watched all the Dave Ramsey videos. <laughs> I'm like, well, actually, if you invested in this, they kids, 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 got money, y'all get on my nerves. But it's almost hoarding. Because there's something about that savings account that lets them know I'm good. There's no storm that can come my way. I got my security. My Money will say to you, let me be your identity. Let me give you value by the valuables you acquire. So no matter your credit score of five, <laughs> kill them tonight, Gucci from head to toe. Because I'm valuable. Do you, do you, oh, don't you say the jacket? 
This Versace, what you talking about? Let, let me give you your significance. Y'all, money, money will say a whole lot of things to you. It's interesting in this text, he does not say you can't serve both God and money. That's how it reads. But if you read it in the King James Version, you'll see another word that might not be a word you've heard before. He says, you cannot serve God and mammon. They translated money, but, but, but mammon is different than money. And Jesus' audience would have been well aware of what mammon was. Mammon, hear me, by definition, was an Aramaic word which means deceitful riches. Deceitful riches. He, he was speaking to the power of money to deceive you. Money will deceive you. Now, while we're on topic, we're going to cover a lot in this series. Please don't miss a single week. I have to say that money in and of itself is not evil. Money is a tool. Money is neutral. Money should be used. Matter of fact, if you're a note taker, people should be loved. Money should be used. People should be loved. Money should be used. People should be loved. Money should be used. People should be loved, money should be used. If you ever flip those things and you start loving money and using people, that is the birthplace of all kinds of insidious evil. But money in and of itself is not evil. It is a tool to be used. It is like a knife. Put it in the hand of a serial killer. Good night. Put it in the hands of a surgeon. It can save your life. Money is simply a tool to be used. I thought the Bible said the love of money is, the, is, is just evil. No, you didn't read the full verse. First Timothy chapter six, verse 10, this is what Timothy actually says. He says, for the love of money is the root of all evil. He didn't say money's evil. Paul writing to his spiritual son Timothy says the love of it is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. He says it's when you love it. It's when all you think about is how you can get more of it. The love of it is the root of all kinds of evil. All we have to do is look at the history books and see evil that has been done on people in this nation for the love of money. People being trafficked and sold because of the love of money. The love of money. He says mammon because of its ability to deceive you. Money, money, money talks, but money also. If blind, I could have done, I could have done money blinds you instead of money talks because when he says it's deceitful mammon, it's talking about money's ability to make you see things differently. Have you noticed this? Yeah. Money has this power to make you see things differently. I laugh at the people saying, man, let me get some and ain't gonna change me. Okay. Because money has a power to change the way you see things. Money will change the way you see yourself. It changes the way you see certain jobs. Have you ever somebody give you a job? Be like, please, that is beneath me. I am not doing that. For that, please, uh-uh. They say, okay, we'll pay you this. All right, what time y'all want me there? <laughs> It'll change the way you see opportunities. It'll change the way you see people. Ooh, should I give it to them? Okay, I'll give it to them. <laughs> I'll never forget a survey I watched they did of, of ladies. They did a survey of ladies and they were gauging whether a man's income affects how they perceive a man. And so these ladies didn't know what the study was for and so they had all these pictures of these dudes and they looked at these dudes and they were to rate them one to 10. And these are just average looking dudes. And so the ladies didn't know what they were being tested on. So they rated these guys like four, five. Someone got 2.1. <laughs> well, then they didn't realize it. They started showing them the same pictures that they rated them like two and five, but then they added one little detail, their occupation and their yearly salary. All of a sudden, some brothers went from two to nine. <laughs> well, engineer, okay. <laughs> well, we, can, we can get the hair fixed, but my God, benefits. Because <laughs> money will change the way you see things. My, oh, money, money will make you arrogant. Psychologists have been analyzing this. It's interesting, when you start moving up the economic ladder, you don't tend to look down to people and simply say, I make more than them. You actually look down on people and start saying, I'm better than them. 
because I make more. If you don't know that money has the power to deceive, you are already deceived. God says you can't, there is no option here. You will serve one or you will serve the other. He said that it's Mammon and Mammon was also the name of a Syrian God. The Syrian God had roots in Babylon. And if you know anything about Babylon, that word Babylon comes from the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel when they said, let's get together and do our hustle and do our grind and let's build a tower that reaches the heights of the heaven. And God had to come down and confuse their languages. It was the epitome of human effort of getting on your grind. That's where this word comes from, this Syrian God, Mammon. And this is simply the spirit of Mammon. Here's the spirit of Mammon. The spirit of Mammon wants you to say, I don't need God because I got money. God, I'm good because I got money. Have you noticed? Broke people don't have a hard time crying out to God. <laughs> have you ever noticed? Have you ever gone through a t I have, have you been through a tough financial season that took your prayer life to another level? Like, oh God, you know now, Lord, you say you on time, but this is due on the 5th, Lord, it is 11 p.m. Father, I need you. What time they say social prayer service is? Tuesday, I think I'm going to go tonight. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how those problems of brokenness will make you cry out to God, but generally when you get the raise, <laughs> you're like, let's go out. What are we get into tonight? What y'all trying to do? <laughs> That's when people forsake God. The spirit of mammon will make you say, I don't need God because I got money. And I'm telling you, it's so subtle, it'll creep in your life, you won't even realize it. Here's how you know that the spirit of mammon has subtly crept in your life, the spirit of I don't need God because I got money. If you've ever made this statement right here, I either need God to come through or I need somebody to give me some money. If you've ever said that, I, I need God to come through. Or I need just somebody to give me some money. Even within that phrase or that thought speaks to the fact that we have put money to the level of God. And if you're not careful, the way it'll trap you is you think you own it, but it actually owns you. And you'll listen to that voice of mammon instead of listening to your true master. God does not need money to provide for you. God does not need money to make a way for you. How many of you know he is a way better master? Oh, he's the only master that if he ever enslaves you, he'll set you free. You'll get that tomorrow. God is the only person that if he ever takes you captive, you'll have more freedom than you ever have in your life. He is the only one whose restrictions bring freedom. Oh, you know you're a good master when your restriction brings liberty and freedom. This is the power of God. He doesn't have to have money to bless you. Matter of fact, I think there's at least 10 people who can testify that you have been in some situations that money could not fix, but God showed up. How I many you know there's some things that will come on your front door that you can't find money to fix it? You need the power, the miracle-working power of God. I wish I had at least 15 people to give a praise break. If you've ever had God step in and fix a situation, that money couldn't fix. Money can't buy you joy. Money can't buy you peace. You can't get no joy at Neiman Marcus, but I got a fountain of joy down on the inside of me. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't. Y'all acting bougie. Would you give God some praise? Like you know, he is the best master and the best provider. Oh, I got to hurry. God doesn't need money. To bring you a breakthrough. God is a much better master. I gotta, I gotta finish. I know I said I wasn't gonna ask for money. Jesus didn't ask for money, but I actually need some money real quick. <laughs> Does anybody, anybody got $71? Anybody got $71? 71. You got, you got, you have seven, exactly 71. Are you for real? Look at that. Can I have it? You gonna let me have it? That is crazy. You have exactly $71. What? It seems like a random number. But I picked that number. You know why I picked that number? Because it's been 71 days in this year. I wanna talk about generosity. That God has given you 71 days. 
I think stewardship actually starts with knowing that every gift, every day rather that God gives you is a gift. And what you do with that day is your gift back to him. It's crazy you at 71. Thank you so much. You don't let me have it? Appreciate it. Why do you, hold up. Why do you have exactly $71? I just picked the most random number. Why do you have $71? It was what? Say it in the microphone. It was given to me. Say what? Who gave it to you? Frank. Frank gave it to you. I bet he did. What's your name? Angelique. Angelique, you know why Frank gave it to you? Because I told him to give it to you. I told, oof, I told Frank backstage, go find somebody and give them $71. I said, pick a random person and give them 71. I said, now I want to see in the service that if I ask for 71, if I get the 71. I was nervous, because I don't know you, Angelique. We ain't never met before. I was nervous she wouldn't give the 71, but I still had confidence, because I said, if she don't give it, somebody gonna give it. You missed that. If she didn't, somebody else would have given it. Even if we had to get a couple, if we had to get 20 here, 20, somebody would have given it. But because she gave it, and God spoke to me this morning, and said, whoever gives away the 71, they're going to get 710. I'm trying to show you the power. I wish y'all would shout. You would shout if it was your 710. I'm trying to show you what God is trying to do in your life and release a flow of generosity. You didn't know you was going to get 71. It wasn't your 71. But God just wants to see, is it your money or is it mine? But if you could ever release it, you got blessings coming you don't know. We'll get up here. I'm about to close. Somebody give God some praise and shout like you know this is your year to start trusting God and releasing some things and know he gonna open up the window of heaven you can sit hear me this is this is the foundational principle of generosity who owns it Does he though? See, the foundational principle of generosity and what will break the spirit of mammon off of your life, this is a mindset shift, let's go deeper, is to know that everything in my bank account, I don't own it. Nothing in my life I own. I'm just the manager. I don't own my house, my name's on on the title, but I don't own it. I don't own my car. Y'all, I don't own my gift. You know how many Sundays I don't feel like coming out here and giving y'all everything I got, especially some of the way some of y'all's faces be looking? Take y'all 20 minutes in the sermon just to crack a smile. (laughs) But I don't ask my feelings how I feel because this is not my gift. Are you an owner of what you have or a manager? Because if everything you have is his, Whenever he says, give me 71, you're like, oh, please, because it's not mine anyway. And I let God choose how he wants to give it back. See, this is where them jacked up preachers who I'm not related to mess it up. Because they try to say, well, if you sold 39.99, he's going to give you three. No, 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 no. I let God pick how he wants to give it back to me. Sometimes I give it to me in favor with a person that I could never get in a room with. Oh, I wish I could tell y'all some stuff. (laughs) I got some lunches coming up and I'm like, how am I about to have lunch with that person? God, God, God can pick any way he wants to give you, but the foundational principle of money and breaking the spirit of mammon off of your life is to understand I don't own anything. God, this is yours. I just manage it. Can God trust you to manage what he's given you? 
you won't give nobody a ride in your hoopty. Why would he give you a new car? <laughs> you won't invite nobody over in your apartment. Tell me, I just really don't do people. Why, why should he give you a house? <laughs> you don't need nothing but that one bedroom apartment with your cat. If you're not going to have nobody over and do life with people. <laughs> Can he use it? It's a mindset shift. I don't own anything. You own this. This will change your mind on tithing. Ten, what is 10% when none of it's mine? Ten, the government take more than 10? Now, that's the Old Testament. You know, that's the law. I'm under grace. And gave $3.25. <laughs> grace empowers me to do more, not less. Because I don't own it. This is not a preacher preaching this to you because he's trying to raise an offering. This is something I've lived and continue to live and strive. And I have to pause and listen to God and say, God, this is the purpose of this series for all of us to ask God, am I honoring you with my money? That's what this series is. God, are you being honored through what you've put in my hand? I'll never forget, first time I got invited to preach, at this church, I was in Bible college. It's my first outside speaking event to preach besides being at my home church. I was so excited. I was like, yo, I'm moving up. Youth group called me to come preach. I will never forget it. I remember the week leading up to it, I was praying, I was fasting, I was seeking God. Got to that youth group, it was packed. Oh my goodness, packed. I mean packed, 23 kids. You couldn't tell me I wasn't Bishop Jakes. I got in there. I, said, I, don't even, I remember my sermon. It was check your mind space. My space was, okay, never mind. I'm just trying to relate it to the kids. I'll never forget preaching. I'll never forget preaching. And I went to dinner with the pastor afterwards. We finished eating and he handed me an envelope. I will never forget this. And I don't ever want to forget this. Hands me an envelope. And inside the envelope was a check for $500, a $50 gift card to Old Navy, I think like a $50 gift card to Chili's. I was like, yo, your boy is rich. $50 to Chili's and Old Navy and $500? Yo, I'm telling you, it was on when I got back to my campus. I was like, Chili's, y'all, get the extra queso. Come on, it's on me tonight. It's like, no, don't get, a, don't get water, get a Sprite. Come on, I got you, I got you. Fall out. But hear me, when he handed me that envelope, as honest as I'm standing before you, I got in the car and my dad will testify to this. I called him. I said, Dad, they pay you to do this. I said, Dad, I, I didn't know anything about honorarium. I didn't know how to spell it. I still don't know how to spell it. I didn't know anything about guest speaker fee. I was just happy that anybody was letting me come preach to anybody. I said, Dad, I didn't know. They pay you to do what I was created and made to do. And I have to always visit that naive, gullible, didn't know Robert. Because I mean, you know, I've gotten a lot of checks since then, way more than $500. Some that have blown my mind. And I have learned and continue to learn. Every check is a check. to see am I going to master this or is this going to master me am I going to use this or am I going to be led by this I do not preach this message on a high horse all of us must wrestle and we're going to do it over this series we must wrestle with ourselves and ask ourselves could God do more through us with what he's given us? Some of us don't even want to look. That's why we don't pay attention to it. But you would be shocked if you actually looked at what you give to DoorDash. <laughs> and you don't even think about it. Have you ever noticed? Always check what you don't have to pray about to give. We all got it. I'm going to be, I know mine. 
I don't have to pray about getting a new pair of shoes. They just fly on me as soon as I see it. As soon as I see it, I know the outfit to go with it. Oh, that's, I know people that's not their thing. It's a trip. Other people, it's books. Other people, it's golf. And can we not enjoy? Of course you can enjoy, but God is always asking you to say, am I operating from the spirit of mammon? And mammon will always give you an excuse to not be generous. Mammon spoke to me today. I heard as clear as day. Do that illustration, $71. Give, to, we got two services. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that didn't come from the offering plate. I went to the ATM before I pulled up on church today. And the spirit of man was like, oh, maybe you should do 300. And God clearly told me today, it's 71 days in this year. If the person gives the 71 in both services, Give 710. And the spirit of mammon was going, it's spring break this week with the kids that could be used for some other thing. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? But I'm going, God, I want to live with an open hand. And I ain't reached the mountaintop yet, but the older I get, I'm getting better. I'm learning little patterns. Like, uh... I'm not buying this outfit because I need new clothes. I'm buying this outfit because I want them in social to go past the killing it today. <laughs> Actually, I'm good. I'm going to keep looking. I'm going to keep looking. You ever done that? <laughs> I'm going to keep looking. Put it back. On hold. I ain't going to come back. Yeah, put it on hold. <laughs> Have you noticed stuff in your life? Like, if, hear me. If you're not asking these questions, you're already under the spirit of mammon. You ask questions like, here's what I've learned in my life and I'm done. As a pastor, people come to you and they, they share things that they struggle with. And it happened in this series. We had people who broke trust in their relationship and they've come and they've confessed. And hear me, it's the most beautiful thing. I'm not a priest. You don't have to come confess on them, but can I tell you, the enemy thrives in secrecy. If there's something that's a secret, hear me, the enemy wants it to stay in secrecy so we can grow. So one of the best things you can do is bring it out in an open, safe place to a safe person and say, this is my issue, this is my struggle, I need help with this. And hear me, anybody that ever comes to me and says, this is something that's been a secret, a leader, I don't ever feel like they're low. I, I, I commend it. Whenever you share something that you could have kept in the secrecy, I always commend that. God can work with transparency. He can heal it but it's got to be revealed. And people will tell you all kinds of things, but you know what nobody has ever come to me and said, Pastor, I gotta confess something to you. I'm greedy. It's never happened. <laughs> Pastor, I, I spend too much money on blank. Nobody's ever said, because greed is the sin that nobody thinks they have. Because we can always find somebody that has more than us. So the guy with no car that's walking is comparing himself to the guy with the car and say, I'm not that bad. And the guy with the car is comparing himself to the guy with the nicer car. And the guy with the nicer car is comparing himself to the guy that has several cars. And the guy with several cars is comparing himself to the guy that has a helicopter. And the guy with the helicopter is comparing himself to the guy that has a yacht. And the guy that has a yacht is comparing himself to the guy that has his own private island. <laughs> and you keep going up and nobody thinks they have it because we're always looking to other people instead of going, God, what do you want me to do? Jesus ends this beautiful passage because he knew what he was doing. When he started talking about you can't serve God and money, I'm sure the whole multitude felt like, some of y'all feeling right now like, oh, I gotta, I gotta analyze some stuff. But look at the hope, look at what he does. Because he knew they were trying to figure out, man, what? Look at what he says, and I end with this. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. 
They do not labor or spend, yet I tell you not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Can you see him? You have little faith. So do not worry. Saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. In other words, your worry and your anxiety has to do with your priority. If you make me the priority, it's amazing how the worry will start to subside, but I gotta be your priority. God says passionately pursue me, seek after me, focus on me, focus on my kingdom. I'm telling you, this will work in anything, not just in your finances. If you need some encouragement, you ought to start encouraging other people. People. Stop looking for somebody to say hello to you. If you walked in with some church hurt, you ought to start looking for somebody else to encourage. Stop looking for somebody to serve you. Start saying, how can I serve other people? Whatever you need, you ought to start giving it away. And as you give it, watch it start coming back to you. Because when you seek first the kingdom and make him the priority, God says the worry will take care of itself. God knows what you need. So my prayer in this series that we would get our priorities in order. Say, God, we're going to put you first. And as we put you first, let generosity flow. Not just in our resources, but in everything that we do. God, let your voice speak so much louder. Oh, oh, devil, oh the devil don't like this message. Let your voice, Jesus. Somebody give God some praise. I'll get a megaphone if I got to. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, the prince of the power of the air, he don't like you talking about this. <laughs> God, let your voice speak louder than the voice of mammon and the voice of money. Father, use our church to be the most generous church. Let us hear your voice. Let us open up our eyes to see the needs of those around us in our community. God, let us live with an open hand. God, give us more stories and not more stuff. <sighs> stories of the way people came to know you because we lived with an open hand. Yes, money talks, but God, you speak so much better. Would you stand to your feet? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If you're in here today and you just be so honest, say, Pastor Robert, I know that the spirit of mammon has been operating strong. Hear me, I'm telling you, it's subtle. It, it creeps in. It'll give you an excuse. You, you can't afford to do that. You, but the beauty of recognizing it is saying, God, I want to grow in my generosity. Help me hear you. That when you speak, my first reaction is to give. Give. 